This is uh, RN205 and this is the pediatric portion and the topics in this PowerPoint and lecture will be general pediatric considerations, communicating with children, uh, doing a health assessment on children, growth and development, developmental theorists, and pain assessment. So we're talking about pediatric nursing. And there are two underlying principles for pediatric nursing, family-centered care and atraumatic care. When you have a sick child, the whole family is affected. The other children may be worried, they may be jealous, but they are affected. And if the, the parents are really stressed and worried about the sick child, that affects the other children. And then the other children may misbehave or act out in ways that further stress out the parents. So we're not, when a child is hospitalized, we're not treating the child only. We're making sure that uh, we're relieving the stress of the parents and we're keeping children and other family members um, involved. If, you know, these children maybe have never been without their sibling, we can do things like FaceTime so that they still feel connected to the child who's in the hospital. The other key principle is atraumatic care. This doesn't mean no trauma, but we are going to do things in the least traumatic way. At Valley Children's, we put in a lot of pick lines because a pick line um, lasts and peripheral IVs, well, they don't, right? They get banged, they get irritated, they're just not that sturdy. And um, so two or three, I, I believe actually three peripheral IVs is equivalent in cost to one pick line. So if a child's going to be on antibiotics for close to a week, it is cost effective to put in a pick line and far less traumatic. We do this once instead of every few days starting a new IV on them. So there's a cute YouTube here that I would um, suggest you, you look at. So communicating with children. We'll look at the different ages, but when you have a, a infant, remember in the beginning all they can do is cry to get their needs met. Um, but they are listening. From birth, they are listening to their parents' voices and they respond to human sound. So it's very good to talk to a baby. Children learn speech from what's said to them. So baby talk is not necessarily great. What we want to do is talk just the next level above where they're at. So a baby who can only cry, they're learning to coo and make other um, vocalization sounds. So that's what we should be doing to them. Ooh, ah. And at four to five months, they really get all those different vowel sounds, the oohs and the ahs. So we want to be saying those. At four to five months, they're also learning to laugh. And they know their own name. Um, and they understand the word no. They know what you're telling them when you say no uh, by four to five months. About six months, they start squealing. That's that kind of shrieking. Uh, usually they do that either for laughing or when they're mad. Um, and then seven to ten months, they start babbling. And this is where they're putting that consonant vowel together, going ma, 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 ma. But it has no meaning yet. They're just doing the sounds. Ma, 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 da, 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 ka, 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 uh, ba, ba, ba. Those are common ones. And by 12 months, those should have meaning to them. Now they should have a few recognizable words that have meaning. So when they say mama, they mean mother. Or when they say baba, they mean a bottle. When we're communicating with toddlers, so infancy is 0 to 1. Toddlers are generally 1 to 3. Preschoolers um, are different developmental theorists develop, divide that up slightly differently, but say three three to five or three to six. Um, so toddlers, so this is one to three. Get down on their level. You're scary when you're standing up. You're big. Come in close very slowly. When you just jump right in there, that's also scary. 
do what you can to help the child be comfortable if the parent is holding them don't take them off the parent's lap you can do most of what you need to do with the parent holding them um, try and develop some rapport play a little game with them play some peekaboo or do something else so that they can uh, feel comfortable with you and know that you're not doing something scary um, sometimes a good thing to do is talk to their doll or their teddy bear or whatever they have there with them um, look around the room if there's Elmo's or dinosaurs or whatever say things about the things you know you can tell that they like um, do be honest with them. Don't tell them something will not be painful if it will, but don't tell them too early. At this age, they're afraid of painful procedures from the time they know it's coming until it's done. So get everything ready and then go in the room and say, there's going to be a whatever and do it right then. So we don't, this age, we don't want to give them very much um, time in advance. Focus on what they will experience. So don't tell analogies or stories. They may enjoy the story, but they don't make the connection that you're telling them what there is going to happen to them. So focus on what they will experience and don't tell them about other children. They really don't care that the child down the hallway did, had this done. They want to know what's going to happen to them. Um, if you've got equipment, let them touch it, especially stethoscopes look like a toy. You know, they're they're scared when you first come in, but if you let them touch and, and handle that, they usually are much more comfortable in letting you use it on them. And I, I love this. There's a doll um, with her IV pole. Uh, you'll see when we do put casts on kids, they often have a doll with the same cast. And here's some kids playing with stethoscopes. So it's not scary once they get to handle it and um, see that it's not something painful. Moving on to school age children, at this age they have a real fear of bodily injury or mutilation to their bodies and they don't have a very good understanding of their body and body functions. So band-aids are a real must because they really aren't sure that their body won't spill out the hole or puncture or whatever um, is going to be done to them. Explain procedures and let them touch equipment. And at this age, um, they can handle being told a little farther in advance, which allows them to ask questions, look at the equipment. At Children's, we have dolls with all sorts of things, and that's a great way for them to uh, understand what's going to happen. Be careful how you explain things, though some words are very scary and then some things we just get very used to saying don't make sense and children tend to be quite um, literal so if you say we're gonna give you a sleeping pill they're picturing the pills sleeping and that's a funny thought how do you swallow a pill when the pills asleep or my half sister well how what happened to the other half of her Right, so so think about how they may visualize something, um, and explain it in a different way that will make sense to them. When you're communicating with teens, do not talk down to them. One thing they don't like is being treated like they're younger than they are. However, they sometimes act like they're younger than they are. Um, teens really do fluctuate between being very mature and being very immature, but talk to them as if they're going to respond maturely. Um, if you need to ask personal and private questions, make sure you do that without a parent. They are not likely to be honest if a parent is in the room and you're act asking about sexual behaviors or um, experimenting with drugs, things like that. And realize for this group, um, their peers are more important and more influential in their life right now than their family. Up till now, it's, it really is the family. Even as they start having friends and activities outside of the family, it's still the family that had the biggest influence on the child. Now, the peers really do. So these kids want to FaceTime with their friends more so probably than with their, their family. So how are we going to do an assessment on a child? We're going to have to adapt that assessment. 
So be non-threatening and proceed from the least to the most traumatic. And it's not just straight head to toe. To toe. So the question then is, what is the most traumatic? What should we put off? And I would say for most kids, it's the blood pressure. Um, so do things that you can do, just observing from a distance first, and then use your stethoscope, and then save the blood pressure for last. So we're going to always look at developmental milestones as well. Um, and that's easy enough if they're, you know, moving around and running and jumping. But what developmental milestones are you going to be looking at in a young infant? So check the newborn reflexes. Um, and those should be gone by about four months. So we're also making sure that they ha don't have prolonged newborn reflexes. So that can be the rooting reflex, uh, the grasp, you know, you put your finger in their palm. Um, it can be that moro, kind of bump the crib or something and see if they startle. So we're also going to be looking at totally different vital signs. Um, you've memorized numbers that does not apply to children and the numbers are different based on age. Realize the smaller you are, the higher your pulse rate is. And um, sleeping is going to be lower. Awake is going to be higher. Awake and crying and screaming is going to be really high. So uh, these are the kind of what our book list is average um, or normal vitals for age. Between 0 and 1, pulse 80 to 180, respirations. 30 to 40 and actually in that neonatal stage it's up to 60 on the respirations and then blood pressure systolic 60 to 80 diastolic 40 to 50 and you can see as they get a little older that one to two years um, the pulse rate starts coming down the respiratory rate starts coming down and the blood pressure starts uh, going up um, particularly on the systolic and um, the diastolic actually we're kind of getting a wider diastolic normal uh, again two to six now we've dropped down quite a bit lower for a sleeping pulse um, but when they're awake and active that pulse is still going to be considerably higher than for an adult uh, six to twelve years it's changed a little more twelve years here's where we're finally now uh, pretty much into our adult, the same numbers as adults. So what makes a difference as this child is growing? Well, obviously things change with age. The gender and size affect this as well. And then activity. Are they sleeping or are they active or are they frightened and screaming? So growth and development, when we talk about growth, those are quantitative things, things that you can measure, height, weight, size of organs, body mass. When we talk about development, we're usually talking about more qualitative. So this is increasing complexity and maturation. Uh, growth and development happens in a very predict predictable pattern. Ha what happens next, we know. How soon it will happen, we don't know. So we say uh, growth and development on a child has a head to tail or a cephalocaudal direction. So in utero that head and the the brain grows more and develops more than anything else. Then the neck, then the trunk before they start having strength out into the, the arms and the legs. Um, and so that also is that um, central to distal First their shoulders get stronger, then their arms, then finally they get good um, coordination of the fingers. So head to toe and central to distal. That's the way development will progress. And we'll stop here and move to the next video.